You can proceed. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to uh, Clickers in the Classroom. Um, this is the LCBC Learning and Technology Development Council's e-pedagogy program. And this morning I'm here with uh, Jeff Peterson. He's in political science at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. And he'll be talking about the use of clickers in the classroom. And so you can get a visual of Jeff and I. Uh, there we are. Um, at the end of the presentation, there will be an email address that you can uh, email your questions for Jeff, and uh, we'll, we'll proceed then. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and have him talk about his experience with Clippers in the class. Well, thank you, Gene. Um, well, let me start off with some really basics here in terms of, well, what we're talking about. Uh, student response systems, which is the official name for clickers, uh, were originally developed um, for marketing research in the uh, business community and for focus groups in uh, political research. Um, and the idea was to provide a way for audiences to provide instant feedback on um, anything that was presented to them. Um, most commonly, these were used, for example, people would watch television ads and they would have clickers in front of them in which they would respond to uh, the visuals that they would receive and people would determine if they were positive or negative. Uh, you see these now during presidential debates all the time where they track, you know, how men versus women are responding to various candidates and sort of a real-time uh, sense of how people are responding. Well, of course, that sort of data is collected without um, any instantaneous change in the product. I mean, you know, it's, when Barack Obama is debating, he's not seeing that ticker move, so he doesn't know that he should change his um, responses. But what scholars realized was that they could use this same information, the same instantaneous data collection, um, to change what they were teaching as they were teaching it. Um, and so the idea was to bring this technology into the classroom and determine you uh, use that on an almost instantaneous basis to modify uh, the way in which things are being taught. Now, I should point out in advance that the vast majority of the research on the use of student response systems is limited to the physical sciences. Uh, this is a, a, a technology that's become fairly popular in physics, in chemistry, uh, in uh, astronomy, thoughts like that, um, and in some statistics and math areas. Uh, the social sciences and the humanities have done very little with clickers, uh, particularly in terms of actually studying their impact. And part of the reason I got involved in this project was to try and come up with a more quantifiable sort of objective assessment of the impact of clickers, at least um, within political science. So um, a little bit about the specifics of the technology. Um, the current version, you'll see, see it's going on your screen, what's called the eye clicker, which is a technology that we adopted, we decided as a campus to adopt uh, about a year ago or so. Um, it uses a radio frequency transmission to a base receiver that's in any classroom. So each of the students gets one of those little white devices that you see on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, and then I can put questions up on PowerPoints or on the whiteboard or whatever I'm working on and ask them to respond uh, to that question. Uh, different, there are a variety of different clicker companies out there. Uh, we just happen to adopt this particular one, so that's why I'm sharing it with you. Um, these results can then be put up um, in real time in the classroom. As soon as I'm done asking a question, I can show the responses of everyone in the room. Uh, we can talk about why students got it right or wrong, why people were likely, you know, the people who got it wrong, why did they get it wrong. Um, so it allows for this instantaneous, um, real time measurement of whether or not students understand the material. Now, pedagogically, this is tied to um, a, a concept called just-in-time teaching. And this is actually sort of what drove me toward uh, using clickers. The idea behind just-in-time teaching is that without some sort of loop, feedback loop for the faculty member, we often, I think, are teaching stuff that our students already know, and we're not spending time on the things that actually confuse them. 
Uh, and so the idea, I mean, you know, I guess we do get that feedback essentially. We get our exams or quizzes, but by that time it's actually too late to modify the material for that semester. You know, I, I was going through this process every semester. Okay, well, what didn't they learn this time? How do I fix this? When it makes a lot more sense to actually get that information instantly. Um, and so just in time teaching says that what we should do is provide as or gather immediate data on every concept that we think students might struggle with so that we can determine if, in fact, they're picking up the information they need, understanding the concept, putting them in the proper context. Uh, and then if they're, in fact, handling the material, they look like they get it, we can move on. And if they don't get it, you know, if they're still having problems based on the quicker responses, then what, you know, the just in time teaching, we should go back, we should reconsider the question, maybe look at it in a different way, go back to the definition, but make sure that we're covering the material that students are, um, uh, you know, do not understand. The, the real underlying element here is, is the flexibility one. It requires faculty members to be able to alter what they're teaching on the spur of the moment. Right? You have to be able to say, oh, wait, my students didn't understand the difference uh, you know, between separation of powers and checks and analysis. I have to go back and talk about uh, so it forces us, I suppose, or even me, uh, to step away from a, a very rigid sort of, this is what I'm going to cover this particular hour, and say, well, these are the things I would like to get through, but it will depend a lot on how students absorb, you know, how students respond to the question. Now, I should also point out that having now done this for several semesters, I have a fairly good idea of the places where students are likely to stumble, but that's not always true. I think a lot of areas where I expect they might struggle, sometimes they don't, and sometimes things that seem obvious they still struggle with. Uh, but to give you a couple of examples of the kinds of questions um, that I would typically use in a classroom, um, this is this is a question that I ask for uh, a basic fact-based question where I ask them, well, which of the following was not included in the First Amendment? Uh, they're given four choices. Of course, the correct answer here is B, the right to arm, so the Second Amendment. Um, and, if you, and then as soon as I get done with the question, I can display that graph, uh, you know, the, so the graph that's over here is not shown until after uh, they're done answering. But I can pop the graph up and say, okay, well, look, 74% of you got it right. Um, so obviously, the majority of the class understands the concept. We can talk about why the other ones maybe got it wrong, although, frankly, with those sort of numbers, I wouldn't worry about it too much. This is an indication to me that I don't have to spend too much time on the First Amendment, but, you know, the, or at least on the case of content that we can move into what does freedom of the press mean or what does right of assembly mean, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this example, the second example, however, um, is one where there's clearly some problems. This is an application question. Um, I'm asking you to take the idea of the full faith and credit clause that says that uh, a marriage in, uh, or a, a legal contract with one state is valid in all other states and ask them to apply it to a specific situation. And here you can clearly see that, in fact, we've got essentially three different results, A, B, and D, um, in which um, about a quarter of the class answered each one. Now, the correct answer in this particular one is D. Uh, the full faith and credit clause says that a legally binding contract in one case must be valid in all others. Um, the fact that they're confused about this means that I obviously need to go back and spend a little more time on the full faith and credit clause. Now, I also use this question as a lead-in to discussions in this case about gay marriage, right? Because the obvious next question is, well, if marriage licenses from one state are from states are legally obligated to accept those under the full faith and credit clause, what happens then when a state legalizes gay marriage? Does that mean other states have to accept the marriage license? So we can get into some, you know, the things that also we do to use uh, questions like this, not just as a fact check, but as sort of a discussion problem. Um, which leads me to um, sort of the, the last kind of uh, broad uh, um, structural thing here, which is some, some basic people asking, what do you use clickers for? Um, essentially, there are six different techniques that are commonly used. Um, the first one is an attendance uh, system. Uh, you know, you can have the, the system will report who's, well, who's quicker during five, three days. It's pretty easy to prevent people from bringing each other's quickers. Um, you can take attendance every day with it. Uh, I use it for in class closing on a regular basis. I just see the short three and five question, multiple choice questions, or true false questions, quizzes. Uh, you can do opinion surveys into a lot of these because that provides great feedback. Do you think we should allow the communists to sleep on campus? Or do you think we should get rid of like 12 college and these sort of things with discussion? Um, I use 
things that are fairly frequently a technique called pull, discuss, and repull. Um, on the question I showed you about full faith and credit, since so many students were so confused, what I may do is after that question, I would say, okay, talk to the person sitting next to you and find out what they think and try to convince them that you're right and they're wrong, and then I'll go back and ask the question again. Uh, this is two things. First of all, it's great stuff for the class writing. And I might teach this class with 125 to 140 students in it, so it's hard to do any sort of in-class discussion, but this is a great way to break it up for about 30 seconds. They get to meet and talk to the people next to them. And again, remember, I actually have never spoken to the board, so they're impossible. Um, and when I read full, I generally find that students have migrated towards the right answer, even though I don't tell them what the right answer is in advance. Uh, so it's a good chance to some quick sort of pure learning experiences, and it breaks up the lecture to some degree. Um, I also use uh, clickers for review of reading materials. I'll ask one or two questions at the start of every single day about the reading they were supposed to do the night before. Uh, this is a way, first of all, to reward people who do the reading, but also make sure that we're all on the same page. And then finally, obviously, we use uh, uh, clickers for the just in time teaching assessment. These are instantaneous feedback on uh, concepts that they may or may not have trouble with. Okay. So that's sort of the basic, you know, broad overview of uh, why you might use student responses and the values they have. Uh, but what I really want to talk about is uh, the actual research that I conducted um, over the last uh, year or so, year and a half, at this point. Um, on how we use clickers and, and what they can do. Um, the research design that I use is essentially a pseudo-experimental design, or what I call an actual design. Um, what I did was I taught two sections of American government back to back, one at 9 o'clock and one at 10 o'clock. Um, both sections had 120 students in them. Both sections had the same syllabus, tests on the same days, content was the same. I should say this on the side, I don't recommend teaching two sections of 120 students back to back on a regular basis. A little exhausting. Um, but uh, the idea was to create a set of circumstances in which the two groups would be as identical as possible, right? Uh, the students were not told in advance that one class would use clickers and one would not. They actually didn't do that. Normally, we have them buy their clickers through the bookstore um, as part of the textbook purchase. Um, uh, to this particular time, I didn't do that until after the first day of class so the students wouldn't be able to go to the bookstore and see, oh, what type of clickers went out and then register based on that information. So uh, students were kept completely in the dark about whether or not they were using the technology until they actually showed up for the classroom. Now, I should also say that obviously we couldn't actually randomly assign people from one class to the other. I actually talked to the registrar's office about this and they, they gave me a look that could only be described as hopeless. Uh, I think would be the best response. Uh, so what we did uh, instead was gather a limited amount of sort of what would essentially called pretest data, uh, GPAs, majors, um, status in school, uh, to compare the 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock section. And all the data shows that the two sections were, for all intents and purposes, the same. Uh, the distribution of majors was exactly the same. The number of freshmen, the sophomores, the juniors, and seniors was almost frighteningly identical. And I think the average um, GPA between the two classes differed by something like uh, six or seven one hundredths of a point. And so essentially we're dealing with two, the only difference between the two groups is that one was willing to get up to nine o'clock, the other one of the way to up ten o'clock to that class. Uh, I, I should say that we also we also track how quickly the two sections fill uh, because there isn't ten and that's one of our concerns is that we might end up with the ten o'clock section tend to fill slightly earlier in the past. Uh, we discovered that probably due to who teaches the data class sections, which normally talks about one of my colleagues, and apparently everyone wants to take the class with him. The ones I was teaching those sections, they feel almost equally quickly. <laughs> um, so both classes uh, were given all of the same uh, basic pedagogical tools, except that the 9 o'clock class was then assigned the purchase quicker. And so over the course of the semester, uh, they used clickers in the classroom and the 10 o'clock class did not. Now, the 10 o'clock class, some people eventually found out about this. They had friends in the other class and things like that. And um, I actually had several students say, why don't we get to use the clickers? That sounds really interesting. And why aren't we adding them? Uh, and I did have a few students in the 9 o'clock class who said, why do we have to buy these stupid things? We don't want to do this. This is a waste of our money. Um, but generally speaking, there's always a whole lot of interaction. Now, because of the nature of how we wanted to do this, we couldn't compare, for example, um, 
we, we couldn't ask the question like, you know, did the clickers make you feel more involved in the class? It's obviously we couldn't then ask that of the non clicker class. So uh, we decided that the best measurement uh, to get a handle on um, whether or not students were performing, uh, you know, whether or not the clickers made a difference. Uh, was to look at performances on several objective, uh, well, on a couple of different objective measures, and one some of the more subjective measures. Um, the, the primary, uh, one of the primary objective measures was their performance on exam. Um, both classes were given the same exam question. I did not tell them this in advance, other than the 955 class sheet, and tell them that class was going to test. And they were randomized um, in the sense that the questions were in different orders, and we used a, a randomizer on the, on the, um, the option for each multiple choice question. So if they just hold their friend, you have to do A, B, A, B, or whatever, that obviously would not work. Um, but in, embedded within the exam, both in the clicker section and in the non clicker section, were questions that I called uh, SRS parallel questions. That is, these are questions that were designed to parallel questions that I had asked in the clicker section. And they weren't the same questions. I didn't simply take a question I asked the clicker as a clicker question. I just dumped it into the exam. But what I wanted to do was design exam questions that tap into the same learning objectives, the same process, the same concept that the clicker questions did. And the idea would be to compare how students performed on the clicker parallel questions and the non-clicker parallel questions. So uh, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, kind of these parallels of these paired questions, um, I, I, I grabbed a couple of these off of my uh, software so that I could show them to you and give you a sense of, of what we're talking about here. Um, so on, on the left side, we'll see this is an example of an actual clicker question used in class. So this is a government office of subsidized textbooks that counter high schools and other prominent ones. This would be a violation of uh, and the answer is the establishment clause. The establishment clause says it is. You're going to provide assistance to one religious organization, you'll provide assistance to all religious organizations. So, Congress shall not establish a religion. And now, the exam question um, instead doesn't ask the question about um, about the establishment clause, it's actually asking about these pre exercise clause. That is, if the government made a religion wine in a religious ceremony, what would that be a violation? Both of these are tests of freedom of religion and understanding the applications of the freedom of religion from the Constitution, but they're not exactly the same. And, in theory, the, the students in the non clicker question should know the answer to this anyway. I mean, this is, we talk about the establishment clause, we talk about the free exercise clause, they should already know this. So we shouldn't actually see a difference between the two unless being involved in like, having the clicker question sort of prompted them to think about it in a different way. Uh, let me give you one more example. This is, um, a little more fact-based than the first one. The first one's a little more application. But the same idea. Um, the first question, the, the clicker question asks them, how do you propose a constitutional amendment effectively? Who gets to decide if the constitutional amendment goes forward? The answer is Congress. Uh, and then in the exam, it asks about the second part of constitutional amendment, which is who ratifies, in this case, it's done normally by state legislature. Uh, but again, they're tapping into the same issue that people understand how constitution, how the U.S. Constitution is modified in the way in which that works, but they're not exactly the same question. They're, they're fundamental, and they get at two fundamental different parts of the process. And so, if the clicker question, if, you know, if, if participation in the clicker really doesn't make much of a difference, then students in the clicker section and students in the non-clicker section should perform roughly the same on these exam questions. Now, these exam questions should show approximately the same rates of success in both sections. Um, that's not what happened. Uh, when we actually look at the data, um, here's what we find. Um, this, the, the graph here shows uh, all three exams that I gave over the course of the semester, and it's broken up into two categories. Um, the, the, the ones that are labeled the SRS questions, these are the ones that parallel the questions. These are the ones that are not parallel to the questions, so they're just regular questions on the exam. And the yellow bars represent the students from the 9 o'clock clicker section, the blue bars are the students from the non-clicker section. And what you'll notice is that on the non um, on the questions that are not directly connected to clicker issues, so that's this one here, right, and this one over here, and this one here, the ones that are non-SRS questions, the results are essentially the same. The differences between the two sections are uh, at most uh, a percentage point. 
but there is enormous differences in the performance of the students on the clicker-related questions. Right? The clicker section um, shows a, a, an improvement of almost 10% in that right, the math on there, um, almost 7% on all three exams on those sets of questions. Now, again, if you know participation in the clicker in class doesn't make a difference in exam performance, then these bars here should be roughly equal. I mean, maybe not as equal as, as you know the next one over, but they should be close. Right? You can argue that the, the clicker maybe just makes them slightly more aware of what's going on. But these performance differences are pretty dramatic, and statistically, uh, they're, they're very significant. Uh, when we ran a paired t-test on the data, uh, what we find is huge, hugely statistically significant differences on the parallel questions, and, and they're statistically non-significant on the non-parallel questions. Um, we also found that within the non-clicker class, there was no difference between the questions. In other words, they did just as well on the non-clicker questions as they did on the clicker questions. So there's no bias. It's not that the, the clicker questions themselves are somehow easier, and that, that's why people did better on them. Uh, the, the results are pretty conclusive here that overall, students who were using the clickers in class had a better handle on that part of the material and were able to show that in the class more. Now, I should also point out that overall, the indifference in the exam scores was not very great only because we didn't include a lot of clicker class. We didn't want to make this really unfair and give the clicker class all B's and A's just because they had clickers. So um, each exam only included um, six parallel questions out of 50. And so the idea was it was enough that we could pick up on this concept, but it's not so great that it would make an enormous difference in the overall exam performance. Uh, we essentially used the same technique uh, to talk about with quizzes. Uh, this class uses uh, Desire to Learn uh, quizzing system, and students are given a quiz essentially on every, at the end of every chapter, chapter's worth of material. Uh, so they actually take a, a total of 12 quizzes over the course of the semester. Um, of those 12 quizzes, or, or sorry, on each of those 12 quizzes, there were one or two questions out of 10 that were directly connected to um, SRS material in class, and then the remaining questions, either eight or nine, were not. Uh, so again, and this is a slightly more immediate assessment than the exam, because with the exam, they're compiling a lot of information and only taking three tests. Uh, with the quizzes, we've got 12 of these, it's an almost weekly measurement after the first week uh, to see how much the impact the clickers have. Uh, and again, what we find, uh, the results clearly show that um, for the students who are using the clickers, um, in this case, there was there's almost an 11 point gap between the clicker class and the non-clicker class on those parallel questions. And there's literally, there's a, there's a, I think, three tenths of 1% difference on the non-clicker question. And of course, this is uh, 12 quizzes, 100 questions, 12 questions, 10 questions to a quiz, so we're talking about 120 questions over the course of the semester, um, with about, I think it was, 16 of them falling into the quicker parallel and, and the remainder not. Uh, so we've got a lot of data here, and the, the data are remarkably conclusive again that something about participating or uh, having those clickers in the classroom makes a difference in terms of how um, the students perform. Uh, and, and, and it was actually about this, when we got to about halfway through the semester, that the students in the non clicker class started complaining about not participating in it because they heard from their friends about it or they would come into the, they would come into the class where after my first class was done and the the uh clicker software would still be up on the screen and they would say, Hey, you know, we could why don't we have that kind of review? We would like to do that sort of material. That would be very you know, that would be very interesting about it. Uh, and so uh, you know, I started to realize that, you know, this is there is there first of all there is clearly this statistical difference, but even more so the difference may be as much psychological as it is, you know, pedagogical. Um, you know, clearly, obviously, um, using clickers in the classroom forces you as the instructor to alter what you're teaching. Uh, you change, you have to change to some degree because you've got to get time. You've got to get these questions out there. You've got to get the responses. You may have to go back over material. 
Uh, and so by nature, it forces you to not just stay at the front of the room and read telephone to them for an hour. Um, so there certainly is a, a, a dynamic there in which you become more, uh, you have to become at least slightly more engaged in, in what's going on in the room. But also because the quicker you've got this sort of breakup of the class period and students are getting involved, and students are learning what's right and what's wrong and why it's right and wrong and the material that they need to know, I think they feel more engaged in it. Um, and so as we start to gather all this qualitative, all this sort of quantitative objective data, uh, we realized that we didn't have a particularly good measure of how students we're going to respond to this in a more sort of subjective sense. Um, now, it, it turned out you know, that that was one of those, well, I wish we had done for the record sort of thing, because we thought about this perhaps more carefully, or more thoroughly, or just, you know, more. We would have realized that we needed to have a pre-test, post-test here as well, do something right at the beginning of the semester that was both content-based and some, some you know, subjective questions. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't do that. So what we have to work with then are the results of the standard uh, student evaluations that are used on our camp or within our department um, in order to get a more sort of subjective, uh, if you will, touchy-feely sense of what the students were thinking. Um, and what we found were several things. Uh, first of all, uh, well, I would say two issues. There's more than two issues of information. First of all, students felt that I was more engaged in the, the clicker class than in the non-clicker class. So we have a, we have a question that says, do you think the, the, the professor is engaged with the material? Um, and do you think the professor was effective? Um, and in the clicker class, I scored higher than in the non-clicker class. Now, that it's also possible that the non-clicker class, because they were the second of the two classes, maybe I was a little less energetic because I had, and this was the second time I was doing all the same material, it's hard to know. Um, but there is a, a pretty clear difference there. Um, the second piece of information that's really interesting is that we find a, a, a we also ask the question, now that you've had this class, are you more, or how, sorry, the questions we ask are, how interested are you, how interested were you in political science before you took this class? And then we ask, how interested are you in it now? Um, and we find a higher proportion of students who indicate a change in a positive direction that clicks the class, that is, they're more interested in it than we did in the non cluster class. Um, the third thing that I thought was really interesting is that given the um, written evaluation that the students provide, uh, we have this sort of open-ended question that I think most people do at the end of their evaluation. Um, in the non cluster class, out of a, a class of 120, there were nine students who wrote some sort of comment to the effect of, if I'd known there was a clicker section of this class, I would have taken it. I wish I could have taken them out the other class. Um, you know, why don't you should use clickers in all your classes? There's something indicating that they actually felt sort of left out, uh, that they didn't think this was fair, uh, or that, you know, that they felt sort of ripped off by the process. On the other hand, in the clicker class, I had one student who wrote a comment that said, um, I thought, he, I thought using clickers was stupid. Now, normally, you know, of course, we don't put much into that. And I put even less into that because I also know for that class that I had one student who never bought the clicker. And now I have a pretty good idea of who the hell was. But so I'm pretty sure I know who that comment came from. I want to simply repeat, and I should point out that our clickers are $36. So it's less, and, and, and to, we have a rental system for our textbook from Seattle. So our students, uh, my students didn't have to buy anything for the class except the clicker. Uh, and so there's this idea that somehow one thirty-six dollar clicker is, is worse than buying a textbook is just absurd to me on its face. Um, and the fact, of course, is that I use readers in the class that are more expensive that had to buy, so I, you know, I mean, but students will, I think, raise a cost issue about anything you ask them to buy. Uh, but the point is, this is the bigger point here, is that there wasn't negative feedback from the clicker students. Uh, in fact, if anything, the feedback in the, in the written comments were things like, I wish you'd ask more clicker questions. I wish we had more opportunities to do this. There were some days you only did it two or three times, which was, you know, five or six, and I'd like the opportunity to do that. You know, thank you for giving us a chance to get points in other ways in class, things like that. Uh, so 
the overall feedback was either positive or constructive in the sense of asking for even more um, than what they already have. Uh, now, to give you an idea of the kind of data we're talking about here, this is the, uh, these are the instructor effectiveness question. So this is the instructor effectiveness question. How effective was, how effective was the instructor in delivering this material? And you'll see that in the, the clicker class, which is the bottom of the two bars, uh, the percentage of students who gave me excellent or very good scores is, I mean, the, the two combined, right, is essentially the same. If the number who scored means this is good, is effectively the same between the two groups. The difference is where this break point is. The break point is an excellent and very good. Um, the the non click class gave me about 61, 62% very good, while as the clicker class gave me something like 73%. Um, excellent. Right? So they, clearly they, they saw a higher level of what they saw as effectiveness. And the graph uh, for the engagement numbers is almost exactly the same. Um, it is the, the, the interest in the political science one I actually think is the more fascinating one to me. Because the one that always scares us are the people who are down here. The one that's where the purple one, the these are people that we theoretically scared away from political science because of our class. Um, in the clicker section, that ended up being about 9% of the students, and that is on par um, almost exactly the percentage we get every single semester. There's always between about 8 and 10% who so after they take American Code of Arts and and say, oh my God, I am never going to do political science again. Don't get me anywhere near this. Um, and the thing is, we actually reduced that to only uh, 4%. So we have, we have a, a much, you know, we essentially cut in half the number of students who said the, the, the class decreased their interest in political science. And now, obviously, as a consequence, uh, but, oh, sorry, but in addition to that, we also shrunk the number of people who essentially indicated they felt no change in their opinion about political science. Now, I should point out that the no change group also includes the people who said they were very interested at the beginning and they're very interested at the end, right? So, I mean, technically, these are people who are still obviously very interested in political science, but uh, according to the measure we created there, we technically listed it as no change. Uh, but there's clearly, again, this significant, and she has to verify this, statistically dramatic difference between the clicker class and the non-clicker class in terms of their level of interest. And over and over and over again, what we're finding is that students feel more engaged, feel like they're participating more, they feel more involved in their own learning, uh, they think the professors are more involved, and they think that the class is more interesting. Now, I should say that there is significant debate in the literature on this, on the, on the physical science side, about how much of this is simply an artifact of faculty changing the way they teach versus students actually learning more. Um, and for the first time, people are now starting to test this using clickers versus other forms of active learning in the classroom. And what they're finding is that the clickers actually are better than, for example, asking the class to all hold up note cards with both cards, which is effectively the same thing on the way the technology. Uh, but students appear to like the anonymity of clicker voting. It means they can express opinions that they might not otherwise express. They can get involved with questions. When I ask polling questions like, do you think we should prevent communists from speaking on campus? I always get about 30% of my students to say yes to that question. Yet I can't imagine if I asked the class to show a hand, how many think we should suppress free speech, that anyone would raise their hand. Right? So this gives them an opportunity to express opinions and ideas um, that they don't necessarily or wouldn't necessarily do in public. Uh, not only that, but the fact that they get this sort of instant feedback about what they're understanding and what they're not understanding clearly helps them under, you know, grasp sort of the bigger picture better. Right? So, you know, we can argue, and I think there will still be a fair amount of debate um, in the South of the teaching and learning community about where the, if, if the invented clicker is actually in the way the class is taught, if it's in the way the students participate, if it's the way the students perceive participation. But in the end, it works. And that is probably the more, most important thing, is that it works. It makes a difference. Um, students want to participate. So I should also point out, I, I forgot to make a graph of this, my attendance numbers go up when I use players because they know that it's going to show up every day. And they're great, a small portion of the grade, 10% of their grade is based on their clicker performance over the course of the entire semester. So as missing a single day actually has no effect on their grade. But as we know, our students can't do math. 
Uh, and so in this particular case, that works to my benefit. They're absolutely convinced that if they miss even a single day of Christmas lunch, it will, it will ruin their grade. Uh, and so in the class of 120, my attendance is routinely um, between 110 and 115 students. Right? So I'm, I'm, I'm routinely getting 90 plus percent attendance, which I never had when I did Christmas class. And my colleagues who teach American national politics without Quakers, um, normally see attendance rates in the 70s, you know, 57 percent range. So we're, you know, we've, we've got a difference here, and, and we also saw this difference between the 9 and the 10 o'clock class. So the 10 o'clock class had lower levels of attendance, was so like 80 percent versus 90 percent. Um, I have to believe that that's in part due to the impact of the curriculum, that, that the students know the points in there, they don't want to miss, uh, pass up on the opportunity to get some extra points. Um, and generally, students do very well in this because they attend the class and ask the questions and participate. Um, it does boost me to use it as sort of a grade equalizer to some degree. The class average on the fifth is somewhere in the range of about 85% or so, whereas the class average on the exam is somewhere in the 76, 77. So, um, I'm going to uh, wrap things up here in the next few minutes because I think Gene has a few questions he wants to throw at me. I'm sure I didn't cover everything I never do. Uh, but just some sort of broad um, conclusions in terms of at least what we're finding and to let you know where this research is going. Um, I think the data clearly show that we'll make, that this makes a difference. Again, I think the big problem is a causal mechanism issue. We don't quite know what the cause and what the effect is pedagogy, if it's the technology, if it's simply the difference. I mean, one of the things that I've discovered is that after I started visiting sectors, for the first time in several years, I was going back to my course and hearing, why do I still talk about this? Do I need to keep doing this? And of course, it sort of reassess the content of what I was doing as well. Um, but the end product is an improved class performance over time. Right? We see that students are, are improving and um, even though I've now taught Clicker Seconds multiple semesters um, using it in many of the same uh, questions, I'm not finding that the performance is dropping off. So if it is something that has to do with me as opposed to the students, you would think that eventually I would get so and for it again, just like I was before. Uh, and that doesn't seem to be happening. So uh, hopefully that's the, hopefully that what we're seeing that is it's not as less to do with me and has more to do with student participation. Um, so they feel more engaged, but not only do they feel more engaged in the class, they actually do better. Right? Their quiz scores were better, their exam scores were slightly better, their attendance is higher, and we all know that attendance is the very first step to doing well in a class, especially in a large lecture class like this. If they don't show up, they don't take notes, they're never going to do well. Um, and so even if all I'm doing is improving attendance uh, to 90 some percent, that seems to me to be a really good first step towards improving their performance. Uh, but most importantly, I think, is that students like it. They feel engaged by it. They don't um, look, you know, they, they don't express any frustration with it. What they express is a desire to do it and do more of it. Um, after the first semester I did this, I was asked by lots of students, do you think we'll get to use our clickers in other classes? Do you know of other classes that use clickers? There's been so much demand for this on campus that, in fact, the registrar's office, I believe starting in the fall, will be designating clicker classes in the course schedule so that students can see in advance which classes they're going to have that use clickers so that they know they should keep them for the past semester, if they want to look for classes to use the technology, um, and that sort of thing. And that, I think, is a really encouraging thought. Um, the idea that students actually seek out these classes because they enjoy them and because they feel they're getting something from it, I think says more than any great improvement could possibly say. Right? I mean, in, in the end, student engagement is what matters. Student participation is what matters, and you know if that happens to then cause them to perform better on the exam because they're more engaged in learning the material, that's great. Uh, and, and you know, I'm, I'm certainly have to explain the test scores go up, but to me, the test scores are simply a secondary measure of a bigger issue, which is how do we get away from lecture at the system that. Uh, you know, without any sort of purchasing them, without you know, being entirely passive. Um, I should also know that the other great thing about clickers is it makes it impossible for students to see in their class. <laughs> uh, because they have to respond on such a regular basis, they have to stay awake 
and with me and out the know when they have to click in. Um, and I try not to make it too consistent, like there will be a clicker every 10 minutes or something like that. Um, and so it's fortunate to stay more with me and, 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 and stay involved. So um, with that, uh, I think what I'll also say is um, there are a lot of technologies out there, technologies that actually allow for many other things than what we do. Um, there are some companies that offer full quarterly keyboards. There are others that offer uh, numerical data entry. Ours is a very simple sort of multiple choice one. Um, what I would encourage anyone who's thinking about using clickers to do um, is A, explore all of the options and make sure you know what you actually want to use them for. Um, for the purposes of what we wanted to do, we wanted quick assessment having them type out full sentences or something simply didn't meet our pedagogical goal, right? And we didn't need something that did number entry because we're using it. We're not a math, you know, this is a math class. Um, on the, you know, so, so know what it is you actually need your clickers to do rather than getting overwhelmed by all the spells and ripples that clickers might present you. And secondly, uh, and I think the smartest thing that we have done on this campus in a long time in almost any regard <laughs> is adopt a single standard. Because once you have a university standard clicker, so that all of the classrooms can be equipped with the same receivers and the students can get one clicker and keep it for four years, you will see not only students use it an increase, but you'll see student complaints about it decrease. Because once you tell them, well, now we thought that you would keep it like a book you can use for four years, you just got to change the batteries once in a while. Um, they then they can see it as more of a, oh, well, I'm going to use this in 10 different classes and it's only four bucks a class. That's a great deal. Uh, but, you know, and when we first started using clickers at Eau I think we had four different clicker technologies going at the same time. And the physics used a different one than, than uh, chemistry, we used a different one than the social sciences, we used a different one than the physics college. Um, and, and, and that created all sorts of chaos um, for the bookstore. It created, I can't imagine the chaos that created for our tech people. I just, I need to remember that. <laughs> um, but it also created a problem for the students because they had to buy a different clicker every semester. Uh, Having a university standard, even if it means delaying implementing places, which you can pick one, adopting university standards is a key to getting this off the ground and, and getting it going out of the campus. So, but I'll stop there and I will uh, let Jean throw some curveballs at me okay. I'm not prepared for it. Sure. Great, Jeff. That's wonderful. Um, one comment uh, I guess I'm going to make about iClicker is that it's easy to change the batteries. You know, it's funny. You don't think about those things when you when you when you're looking at them. But there was one company whose name we won't mention in this room, um, who who you needed so you needed um, jewelry screwdrivers and a microscope and and lead gloves and I don't know what else. I mean, the only people who could do it were, were like the, the, the help desk people in the bookstore were the only people equipped to do it, and it created absolute chaos. Yeah, you don't think about something like that. It's really important. So know your product. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's very, and, and test run it. Test run it. Use it in lots of classes. Experiment with it before you adopt it because um, you know, the biggest mistake you can make is to adopt them without trying it, and then you get stuck with a lemon. And there right. is nothing worse than a, you know you knowing that you're stuck for an entire year with a thousand cookies that are die on you at any minute. Or the software doesn't work. You know, you, you, well, one of the ones we use, you know, I'm a Mac user. It doesn't have any Mac compatibility. Okay, so now what do I do? You know, I mean, those are the sort of things you've got to sort of have a checklist. I think it's things that are important. Okay. Um, I know also that we used it in uh, faculty academic staff senate, mm -hmm. too, uh, for voting purposes, mm -hmm. but that's a good way to introduce you know, the faculty that might not be using the technology. Yeah, actually, that's, I, I've been re I'm really pleased that we do that. We've been using that now in faculty senate for, I think, a little over a year now, and um, we do it as purely anonymous voting. We don't even have to register the clickers. People can grab them when they walk in the room. They can vote. Um, yeah, and that, and I remember the first day that the first time that we did it, and people were like, what are these things? Why do we have these? And there were four or five of us in the room where clicker uses it with me, and uh, um, some of them said they were like, oh, yeah, well, this is what it does, this is what you do, and this is how it works. And, and they seem very comfortable with it. Uh, I know that they're also using it over in the library now for some of their sort of things. I know um, uh, some of the uh, academic staff are using it for some of their introduction to the library classes to get sort of instantaneous feedback on students and whether or not they're understanding what's happening. And, and I, I think the more you expose students to it, 
the more likely they are to get involved with it and, and, and appreciate it, you know. Uh, the other thing I'll point out for all of you who want to be sticker users is make sure that you have a fair for yourself. A, because there's nothing more embarrassing than having your badge design in front of class. But B, uh, one of the things that I, I don't want to pitch a particular company, but one of the things that iClicker does that I really like is that the student clickers are white and the faculty clickers are blue. And so you can loan out one of your clickers to a student to forget the clicker for the day. It's really easy to do, and the software will let you do it in about 10 seconds. And they can't leave the room because they've got your blue clicker, and it's really obvious who they are, uh, that they've got a clicker they're not supposed to have. Correct. Uh, another thing, you mentioned enrollment, and that's sort of something that keeps my interest. Um, the first day that you enroll 125 students, how long does that take? Uh, the registration system takes, the, by the way, I suppose it depends on the software you're using. I put their software, um, I can get the entire class registered in 10 minutes. Um, once the I put their head, all I have to do is import my roster file into I put their, uh, I download it off of the mainframe just a part of the class, so I've got all the most recent act drops. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just got a scrolling list of all of their students' uh, email addresses, student email addresses that go by. And they just have to enter, they click one button and go through one part of the screen, and the second button and go through the next part of the screen, and it's automatically registered them. So yeah, I can do 125 students in 10 minutes. Um, usually, of course, because you know, we've got that two week ad drop period, people are coming in and out of the class, I usually end up having to run the registration screen itself every day for about a week. But after the first week, it runs for 30 seconds because there are only like half a dozen names on it, so it looks really bad. So, but it, it is about the most idiot-proof registration. <laughs> I, and again, um, having been part of our, you know, I was part of all the test groups and guinea pig stuff, having worked with some of the other products, um, the iClicker registration seems to be the most idiot-proof one we've ever seen. There may be others that, are, that have gotten better, but compared to some of the other ones. And, and, and the nice thing is that it registers it, that, that particular clicker just for my class, just for that semester. Um, so, you know, they don't have to worry about um, having it, you know, what happens if I take this class a different semester or I take class, you know, it's perhaps at the same time or, you know, you know each, each, each registration is individual to the faculty you know. So there's no, you know, you know any problems with that, which we have with some of the other software packages. It's hard for a correct Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Um, in your 10 o'clock class, mm -hmm. was that a strict lesson series class then, or did you use active learning in it too? Uh, I did some active learning in the class. I tried to, and since we weren't going to click or to have discussions, I would stop occasionally and ask questions like, okay, are we, you know, what does this make sense to you? You know, if I do, I would throw out an example and see, you know, how many of you think you understand this. And of course, inevitably what I get is, you know, the, the 10 kids who talk all the time, <laughs> would always be the ones that say, oh, yeah, they understand it, and then I would get the examples and discover that they didn't. So, uh, in, in many ways, it, I, I tried it, uh, but my experience is what I always had with large lecture classes is that the vast majority of the students, I, I don't know if they're afraid to get involved, they don't feel the need to get involved, they, you know, they don't want to embarrass themselves in front of their peers or, or what it is, but the, the level of engagement was just, just you know, I don't want to say disturbingly low, because it's always that low. I mean, that's what I'm used to. Um, and that's actually one of the things that makes the ice clicker participation so uh, different, is that so many people are participating. Mean, literally, everybody in the room is giving you your feet, so they telling you what they think or whether they understand the concept six, seven, eight times an hour. I so you're tapping into their thought processes really quickly. Um, and it's really fascinating because you, you learn a lot about um, not only where, I mean, it, it, you know, what individual things you can track their individual responses after class very easily. But you can see sort of group dynamics take place. And when I would do these classes during election years, I get very different responses to some questions during non-election years and, you know, levels of interest and things like that. Um, and, and so you get, you get this sort of constant sense of being engaged with them, even though none of them are actually talking to you. Uh, and that, I think, is really, uh, I think it's helpful. And I think that I have, I have found, for example, I use this, I use the example in my presentation about the, the difference in checks and balances and separation of powers. 
Now, this is one of the things that political science thinks is we, we, we have to understand this different from our understanding of basic, not just American government, but how most governments work. And what I discovered is in some cases that most people can't tell the difference between the two. They don't understand that they're really two fundamental different concepts. Uh, and so, in the first couple of times I just like, oh, gee, I just stop and go back and go over this. Well, now I know that they, this is a constant problem. And so I've already tailored a lot of material I do to get to that and sort of capture those differences, and I think that that helps. Uh, but uh, it is it is remarkable because, um, yes, yeah, students really want to give you that feedback. They're just kind of afraid to do it like that. And, and, and this gives them that anonymous, consistent... I should point out, by the way, the eye filter have a little light that goes on, so they know their body is recorded. Um, and they know that, they, that, that, that I know what they think. Um, that was the first, oh, how do you know about that? Oh, no, I feel like the one, okay. Yes, and <laughs> they can also change their response. In, in right. In time. Yeah. yeah, okay. And in fact, they, they, during my, my quizzes or my questions, you get a 30 second timer on them. They can, if they put one answer, they're all waiting on that side, they can, they can, they can change it. Or you can ask, I also ask the same question at the beginning, at the end of class, you know, they're changing their responses. I love to do that when we talk about things like the first event, but I'll ask getting our class some parts that who we could even restrict three people. Now, at the end of the class, the same question. Um, and I put there a lot to instantly put up the graph between the two versions of the, the you know, here's what you said at the beginning of the class, and this class. Now let's talk about why you changed. Right? What, what happened here? Um, so it's not just for this sort of objective measure, although the objective measures are great, but it, it can lead to those sort of really fascinating discussions and talk about, well, now, now wait a minute, now why do you think this? You know, what, what makes you believe that this is okay or not okay or, or you know, um, you know we, when we talk about the presidency, we'll, we'll compare the Nixon impeachment to the Clinton impeachment and we'll talk about the differences. What's that is important, you know, one of the things we talked about is how the, the, the concept of impeachment is really very vaguely defined in the Constitution, so almost anybody can impeach for almost anything, theoretically. Uh, and so we talk about, you know, the beginning of the class, where you're looking at, do you think those are going to impeach? And usually, the majority of students say yes. And then we talk about, well, okay, what does the teacher actually mean? What was it intended for? And we get to the end of the class, and we say, okay, now you think you should have been impeached. And almost everyone says no. And it's not my goal to change their mind, but it's my goal to wake them up to what's really going, you know, how it's supposed to work. And then, okay, now what happens? And, 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 and those are the conversations that I think are phenomenally valuable, because it allows you to see the change in their thinking over the course of just a single hour. And if nothing else, it's in my mind, self-validation. So it means that I've actually had a good impact on them, and I like knowing that. <laughs> yeah, that's important. Um, I have something down about scoring and grading for questions. I know some faculty will give positive points for wrong answers also. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Oh, yeah. Well, my, my system is set up so that um, every time they answer a question, they get technically they get a seven tenths of a point every time they answer a question, if it's the right wrong question. If they answer it right, they get an additional three tenths of a point. So basically, it's seven tenths of a point they get it right or wrong, then they get a full point if they get it right. Um, for all of the opinion based questions, obviously, they get a full point for all of that. And I would say my questions divide out roughly half opinion, half, yeah, I'm not a third, a third opinion, probably like two thirds factor based on the you know, the readings and stuff in class and things like that. Uh, but because they're generally questions that either refer back to the material we just talked about literally in the class or the stuff we just talked about the previous day, most of the time the majority of students get the questions right. I mean, I, I, I'm used to that. And, 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 I, and, I'm, and I'm not doing it in the sense of trying to discriminate. It's not like a test of trying to discriminate between the students who are studying and the students who are not. My preference would actually be to have everybody get 100% on every single question. Right, because this is, this is not discrimination, this is sort of affirmation for them that they understand the concept, and affirmation for me that they understand the concept. Um, so, um, you know, the fact that, you know, majority of them get most questions right is fine, and I, that, that's my preference, is things are actually getting a handle on the material and I can move on. So, uh, you know, that said, um, there are going to be some, I mean, you know, students who, uh, you know, don't show up, obviously. I mean, that's the other thing is, is this, this reward students who attend, who do the work, who take good notes. Um, the students who don't attend, you know, they throw away a chunk of their grade. And, and if they choose to do that, you know, fair about that business. Mm -hmm. so, okay. so. 
Now, you'd mentioned that you have readings and, and you use the eye clicker to see if they actually did the reading. What? Uh, is that effective? Do you find that later on in the semester they're all doing their readings, whereas maybe in the 10 o'clock they <laughs> may be reading? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. We, uh, one of the things that I just wanted to get was really interesting to me was in the, in the, in the clicker class, and, and this is actually true all every semester I've ever done, um, they don't think I'm serious. And so the first week or two, they're still not doing the readings, and the bulk of them are getting the questions wrong over. And, and, and I keep saying, you know, you guys are throwing away points here. If you do the reading, and slowly but surely over the first couple of weeks, I see the numbers get better and better and better. And I start, you know, coming to classes, you need to get set up. A few students with their books out, they're actually doing the reading. Even if they're going to just before class, I don't care when they read, as long as they're reading, right? I mean, that's just important. Um, and, and, and by about this point in the semester, now the point where we are about uh, five, six weeks in the semester, now my students are consistently getting, I would say, 80% on, 80 to 90% of them are getting the reading questions right every single day. Now, I'll keep doing them. I mean, I don't want them to, you know, I don't want to stop if they're getting them right. Um, but it will reach a point where essentially they're getting, almost all of them will get it right on a legal basis because they're all doing the reading. Um, and, and there's no question to me that that can prove other things as well. I mean, my exam, exam always includes some questions that are from the books that I don't talk about in class at all. And those are actually, it's interesting, I've always used those as my sort of discrimination questions between the good students and the bad students. They don't work so well anymore because <laughs> now everyone's doing the reading. And so the book questions are not tricking up as many students as they used to. Um, and yeah, in the 10 o'clock class, I know they weren't doing the reading. I mean, it was obvious. I actually, um, would ask questions. I would start at the beginning of the hour and say, okay, so what was the reading about today? Anyone know a show of hands? And literally, no one in the room, 120 students, would raise their hand. I, I said, are you kidding me? No one had the reading? And one guy would start to say, well, why should you just be wrong? Right. You know, so, I well, can't humiliate the poor guy for asking you. So, I, so yeah, I think that, um, I mean, it obviously it helps in terms of the in-class engagement. There's no question. But I think it also improves, you know, combining the, the quicker technology with the just in time teaching model that is, you know, that, that, that reinforces the constant reinforcement of their positive behavior, um, clearly makes a difference. I mean, they're definitely more involved, they're definitely more engaged, and they seem to be, um, you know, they seem to be enjoying it. So, I couldn't ask for much more, I'll take it there. <laughs> Great. Well, this has been wonderful. Uh, and thank you for all of me as you look at the archive, which will be available soon. Um, and if you have any questions for Jeff, uh, just email him at the address that's on the screen, petersbd at uwec.edu. And uh, thank you. And thank you, Jeff. Oh, thank you. This is wonderful. Great.